It's a talk based on her experiences writing the uh, fantastic Fungi Community Cookbook. And we have a link to that book on our website. Uh, due to the time difference, it's now 10 p.m. in New York. The presentation will try to end promptly at 8 o'clock. And if you have unanswered questions, you're welcome to email uh, Eugenia uh, at a later date. <clears throat> so uh, Eugenia has written many books about food, nature, and mushrooms. She's a teacher. She's an accomplished cook. She has a scientific knowledge of mycology and is a past president of the New York Mycological Society. She's also been, she's always been fascinated by wild foods, especially mushrooms. As a child, she remembers building a fire on a beach to cook mussels that she had foraged. Um, Currently, she's working on the final stages of a book about psychedelic psilocybe. So put that on your Christmas list. Please welcome Eugenia Bone. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, SF. I'm really glad to uh, be connecting with you all again. Um, uh, yeah, so I really, I originally was hope Mike and I were talking in, uh, last year, and I was hoping that I could talk about this new book, um, but it's just not ready yet. It doesn't come out until um, next October. Um, my publishers are saying, you know, maybe we should have it come out right around the election, because people are going to need a new book on psychedelic mushrooms then. Um, but uh, at this point, I've got, I, I, you know, I'm just not ready to write a talk on it. I do have a title. We just came up with the title. It's called Have a Good Trip. <laughs> so, I know it's a little irreverent, but that's kind of, um, that works for me. And I hope it does for the readers too. So I'm going to, anyway, because I couldn't do that um, talk and I'll have to, hopefully I'll be able to come back and do that next year. Um, I am going to share this other book um, talk. And, and uh, the thing that's kind of, fun about it is that I can give you some behind the scenes on how a book like this gets made um, in the hopes that maybe the MSSF will do a community cookbook of your own someday if you haven't already I'm not I'm unaware um, so I'm going to uh, share my screen and we can get started Okay, is everybody seeing my groovy uh, um, cover slide? Yeah? Yep. Excellent. Okay, um, so uh, once again, thank you, Mike, for inviting me, and um, I'm glad that we're going to have this hour together. So this, um, uh, so I've been a, a wild food enthusiast, as Mike mentioned, for a very long time. That story about um, cooking mussels on the beach. I actually was so young that I had to bum, I had to lie to a bartender at a beach club. You know, we were, this is my parents used to have a place in Provincetown and there was this, you know, beach club that had a bar on it. And so I went up and said, oh, my mom needs matches for her cigarettes. She never smoked. But, you know, I was small enough where it's like I had to lie to get some matches. But I did make a little hole. I did find the mussels in the breakwater and I made a little hole and I was trying to cook those mussels. Didn't work very well, but um, it sort of is an indicator of my long interest in wild foods. Um, so I've written four cookbooks and I've contributed to many others as well as lots of food magazines when there were food magazines, I guess, especially Sever. Um, I'm also, uh, I've also written an, uh, some um, popular science um, like Mycophilia, um, which is a book about um, uh, hunting mushrooms and mushroom foragers. Um, and uh, this uh, director, Louis Schwartzberg, um, who had just started getting excited about mushrooms, read Mycophilia and reached out to me. And um, I had a, a, a little cameo in his movie, Fantastic Fungi. 
So Louis self-distributed that movie. Um, it's kind of like uh, like he self-published the film because um, he didn't get offered a good deal by Netflix or any company like that up front. So he said, well, screw you. I'm going to do it on my own. So he took that film to one little theater after another and introduced it. And he took down emails and he really built this community, he built a momentum that eventually um, got big enough to to warrant a, a, a proper deal with um, a distributor. Um and but the the you know the the takeaway from that experience is that he he built a kind of community. Um, in the summer of 2020, uh, Louis asked me um, if I would do a fantastic fungi cookbook. Um, you know, I was like, oh, there's just there's a lot of good forager chef cookbooks out there, um, including your homeboy Chad Hyatt's Mushroom Hunters Kitchen. So, um, so I was really skeptical about another forager book, you know, certainly one from me. Um, so I was like kind of ambivalent. And then, you know, then it hit me, wow, why not do a community cookbook? I mean, I love community cookbooks because the recipes are well-tested. Um, they tend to have this really simple authenticity. They're really based in place. Um, and What's more, a community cookbook uh, kind of conceptually worked with um, the movie because for Louis, like his takeaway from doing that project is that mycelium is a metaphor for um, collective action, how we all do better when we are connected to and help each other, right? Um, but the, and, and so, you know, groovy idea, right? It looks, why not? Um, but uh, how are we gonna pull it off? That was the, you know, question and that's, kind of what I want to share tonight. So my, I, my idea, my original idea was let's create a website um, that's associated with the, uh, the film's website um, where on it we can have interactive recipe sharing. Um, and if we, and if it worked and people liked it and we had enough recipes, then maybe that would generate a book. And so that was, you know, deemed successful, uh, uh, deemed possible. And um, uh, so we started to, you know, share these like emails and talking about what, how that could look. And um, these first discussions were going on in mid-July. And there was these people copied on all of our, my discussions with Louie and some of his people, you know, and his staff. And they were called magical threads. And I was like, what the hell is magical thread? So I looked them up and I saw this and I was like, oh, wow. But magical threads is like a brand, a company that builds brands and stuff. And so Louis had employed them to kind of take the Fantastic Fungi brand the next step. Anyway, they turned out to be incredibly sweet people, very easy to work with. Um, and um, together we figured out like the format for this website. So the, there had to be, you know, we had to really think about, the, I had to really think through what, a, how a recipe is built. I mean, I, I write cookbooks, like, you know, I write recipes all the time, but thinking at it in anticipation of how someone else would use it was, a, you know, really an in-depth analysis for me. So in developing the recipe guidelines, I had to I had to figure out how to communicate to people so they really could anticipate the sort of questions that the reader would need. Like, if you're gonna say put wine, you gotta say dry or sweet and so on. Um, and then I had to think through things like, um, what if a recipe pause it? Because we had a format, are they gonna load into that format? You know, what are the ingredients and what are the instructions? But um, what if the recipe has three parts, you know, or two parts, let's say a quiche, it's got a crust and it's got um, a filling. So we had to kind of figure out how that would work. And, you know, so there'd have to be selections of people to pick whether their recipe was composite or simple. Um, and then we had to think through a list of mushrooms. Uh, I wanted to make sure that when somebody said they wanted, they were calling for chicken mushrooms, they weren't actually meaning hens, you know? So um, so I insisted that when we list the mushrooms for the recipe writers to, to select, like these are the mushrooms that are in my recipe, um, the uh, that the Latin binomials were included. And 
oh my God, you cannot imagine the resistance I got from everybody. You know, uh, the magical threads people lose. Everybody was like, oh no, Latin binomials are too complicated. And I, you know, I kept pushing. Finally, I was like, it might help you avoid being sued. And so they were like, oh, that sounds fine then. Let's go with the Latin binomials. Um, anyway, I was also like worried about trolls, you know, people maybe putting in recipes that were somehow uh, dangerous, you know, maybe preparations that needed special care. Like if someone did a gyromitra esculenta recipe, you know, I wanted to make sure that, you know, it was going to be a recipe that wasn't going to hurt somebody. Um, I was also concerned about um, recipes that included mushrooms that could be um, easily misidentified. So I had this editor's note I added. Um, I contacted uh, these kids, Ryan Bouchard and Emily Schmidt in um, on the East Coast, and then David Campbell, who I bet most of you know, um, on the West Coast, and they agreed to um, kind of be consultants for me on, um, you know, should any mushrooms that are unfamiliar to me turn up um, and, uh, you know, get some feedback and advice from them. But it turns out that really the oddest thing um, that we got was psilocybes. And I actually, <laughs> yeah, I was also worried about getting enough mushrooms to test the recipes. I mean, I didn't know what kind of recipes were gonna turn up and, um, you know, New York City is pretty provincial when it comes to wild mushroom retail. It is not like uh, San Francisco at all. So um, I went on a hunting rampage with these two guys. This is Charles Luce from the um, New Jersey Club. And this is Paul Sadowski from the New York Mycological Society. And they were great. You know, we found all kinds of mushrooms, which I froze up. Um, in anticipation in case somebody, you know, I don't know, came up with an entoloma recipe. Um, these two, by the way, they're so respectful in the woods. Um, see this chicken? It took them like 20 minutes to remove that chicken with their knives. They were cutting so, so carefully. It was like they were removing a mole from someone's arm. They're really, um, so they, they're really great examples of how to behave in the woods, those two brothers. Um, come on. Ah. Um, okay. And so while the while the website was being built by um, uh, um, while the website was being built, um, I started to kind of just talk to people to kind of build up my knowledge a little bit. Um, and so I had long conversations with people I considered the expert mycophagists, like Eleanor Shavit. Look at those pony kegs of dried mushrooms behind her. Um, and uh, Chad Hyatt, who I hope you know, and um, Alan Burgo in the Midwest um, about cooking techniques and, uh, you know, just basic tips. I mean, and they shared lots of information with me that I applied when I was testing recipes or when I was trying to solve some problems that I encountered in recipes. I think, um, but I think one of my favorite comments was from Chad when he and I were talking about the total non-controversy of watch, washing mushrooms. Um, and he said, of course you can wash them. I mean, most of the time when we're hunting for them, it's in the rain. So it's from these chefs that um, I kind of learned, you don't have to cook mushrooms in fat. You can dry saute, you know, first you, br you brown the mushrooms in a dry pan and then you add liquid if you, uh, if you want or fat after the fact, or, or you can wet saute, which is to combine the mushrooms with a small amount of water and cook them really rapidly. And when the water cooks out, you can add, you know, seasonings or fat or whatever you like. Um, I learned that it's maybe a good idea to salt mushrooms after cooking them. Um, there is an old wives tale that um, mushrooms will be more tender um, if they're salted afterwards. And I think that could very well be um, because um, salting urges the, the kind of quick release of moisture um, from the mushroom, which makes the mushrooms cook up a little drier. And what that ultimately means is the ratio of chitin to mushroom fi uh, to um, water in the mushroom uh, you know, changes and they become tougher and more fibrous. 
Um, but that's uh, uh, that's my speculation. Um, there's uh, uh, lots of recipes uh, when they came in, uh, when I started reading them, uh, that say to caramelize the mushrooms. Um, in the book, we don't, uh, we didn't end up saying uh, to caramelize because mushrooms don't actually caramelize. That's caramelization is when the carbs and sugar in plants turn brown and it adds flavor. With mushrooms and meats, um, uh, they don't actually caramelize. They experience something called the Maillard reaction. And that's when the amino acids and the sugar um, turn brown and add flavor. So um, one of those uh, amino acids is glutamate. And that's what's responsible for the umami flavor in mushrooms, that meaty savoriness. Um, so we launched the website in uh, late September, 2020. And by mid-November, uh, we didn't have many recipes. And yeah, I was thinking, eh, this is not going to happen. Maybe this book is a bust. Um, but uh, I figured maybe it also just needs a little juice. And so I started loading in my own recipes like these and, you know, putting the squeeze on friends um, uh, and recipes from friends. So, um, for example, this uh, dish, this uh, farfalle with gorgonzola and black trumpet sauce, that's from Mike Wood, who I think is in the MSSF. Um, and, or maybe one of the other Bay Area clubs, possibly. Anyway, um, Mike, um, this recipe is so fabulous. So it's you really could use any gorgonzola sauce recipe that you like. Mike uses um, Marcella Hazan's. Um, but then you saute, you dry saute those um, uh, black trumpets separately, and then you combine them with the um, with the gorgonzola sauce. And then you could toss, you know, we did farfalle, but you could do gnocchi, you could do, you know, the fettuccine or something. Um, the, the flavor combination is fantastic. I mean, it's like 50 shades of mustiness, you know, it really, those, those black, those smoky, those musty flavored uh, black trumpets go really, really well with gorgonzola cheese. Anyway, these other dishes, you can see, this is all stuff like me churning out recipes. Um, I, uh, you know, I lurked on around Instagram and Facebook, you know, reaching out to good mushroom cooks saying, eh, send me some recipes you know, share your recipes with us. Um, and I, um, I invited every club and said, eh, tell your members, see if they'd be interested in sharing recipes. So, you know, the recipes are up permanently, you know, um, I would review all those recipes to make sure they were safe. And if I had a question, I would ask David, for example, David Campbell, but they're up there um, in perpetuity. And it's, um, you know, so the, that value you know, never went away and never goes away. And um, I don't know if people have continued to put mushroom recipes up because I don't have a vehicle to get into the site anymore. Um, but anyway, by early December, the recipes started coming in, you know, about every other day, there'd be one or two. Um, for example, I just remade this dish, pappardelle with pumpkin and bolites delicious. Um, this was a beautiful little pickled grayling. They're such an elegant little mushroom and they're tiny and, and sort of delicate and pickling them. They really hold their um, shape beautifully. And, you know, they're gorgeous on, um, uh, on top of different kinds of foods. Um, the um, enoke, this is an enoki tofu um, uh, miso soup, which was uh, thrilling to me. Um, and this dish was a, a porcini onion dip, which is like an onion deep dip with porcini powder in it, but you have to heat, the, you know, to saute that porcini powder. Um, uh, otherwise it has, it doesn't, it, the, it's too mm, like dusty and metallic a flavor, but when you heat it up with a little butter, you know, when you're cooking the onions, it's fabulous. Um, recipes like this, you know, were just, awesome and they really gave me a lot of confidence about like the future prospects for this book um and let me tell you a quick story about this enoki soup 
so it's really simple. It's miso, um, it's miso enoki, um, tofu, you know, some, um, a little bit of some spices. Uh, we can see a little hot pepper spice and, um, uh, um, and that's it. I mean, it takes like, it's got like five ingredients and takes like 20 minutes to make. It was delicious. Um, but I had made it, you know, when you do these recipes, they're for four and there's only two in my household now. So we had leftovers. And the next day um, I had a bunch of clams, believe it or not. And so I thought, well, I'll just add, I'll just boil the clams in this, in, in this soup. And I thought, well, you know, the enokis are a lost cause. They'll be like limp and like spaghetti and they're just going to be awful, but I don't care. You know, I'm going to keep eating it. Flavor was good. And the, um, and actually that's not what happened at all. Even despite the second cooking, those little skinny enokis were even a little bit tough and they really held up their integrity well. And I think it's because of the chitin um, that's in the mushroom. That's that tough poly, polysaccharide that's present in fungal cell walls. I actually think that chitin is one of the most um, important reasons, it's one of the key reasons why cooking mushroom uh, mushrooms is so different from cooking vegetables. Because if you boil a potato for 20 minutes, it's going to dissolve. But, uh, or let's say, you know, an hour or whatever. If you boil a potato too long, it's just going to melt. But a, a mushroom will hold its integrity. And I think, and, and I think that's because of the, the chitin in its cell walls. Anyway, this incredible um, onion dip, it comes from Allison Gardner of the Mendocino Club. So I'm going to mention some of the California people when they come up. Um, so the recipe started coming in uh, using mushrooms in place of meat in traditional recipes like this um, uh, mushroom burger. So it's like a classic portobello burger, but the author, who the rest of the recipe writer, who's from the UK, she she uses Havarti cheese in it, which completely changed uh, what is a normal uh, portobello um, burger into a whole new experience. Much much meatier, much richer. It really worked well. I was I couldn't believe it. Um, there's lots of recipes where mushrooms augment a known dish, like here. You can't really see them so well in this picture, but it's linguine with white clam sauce and hericium. Um, there is one author who is like a master of this. Uh, lamb tangine, beef pie, chicken yam, dish from Senegal, Hungarian stuff, pe stuff papers with all with mushrooms. You, you know, you name it, it on and on. It was like a UN of recipes um, that uh, and she's one of the stars of the book. So we have so many uh, wonderful recipes from her. Um, we also got recipes using medicinal mushrooms like chaga chocolate chocolate cookies um, and uh, strawberries poached in birch polypore syrup. And they're exotic and delicious um, and super interesting uh, um, recipes. And then we got drinks too, shrubs, and teas, and infused vodka. And this, um, a spectacular cap bourbon and milk punch which I've actually drunk many, many times. So when it comes to, you know, looking at these recipes as a whole, I began to notice, you know, particular pairings that um, most, most mushroom recipe writers seem to like. For example, over and over again, we saw cream, eggs, butter, cheese. So looking here, these are some of the recipes we ended up publishing. This is pompano with key lime, burr blanc, and black trumpets. That's from Mary Smiley, who some of you may know. Um, this is a chanterelle cream sauce uh, with a, a, a with a fillet. Um, I have to say, this is like a perfect recipe. I've made it many, many times. The sh and the reason why is because the whole thing times out really well. If you like the way, so the, 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 the beef recipe, you know, the recipe that came in from the author who's a chef in um, Alabama, uh, I think in Alabama, as I recall, um, the, he just sent the, the sauce in and I was like, well, we've got to have something to go with it. So he, I said, it's okay if we do a filet mignon recipe with it. He's like, sure. So we used the recipe that I learned from uh, Jim Osland 
who was many years ago uh, editor at Sever and is a cookbook writer and he's wonderful. He just did a book on Paris. And so he said, this is what you do. This is a perfect recipe. You um, get your filet mignon, not a really super thick one, but you know, like a two inch, uh, a, a two, two and a half inch thick filet. And um, you brown it in a dry pan that can be, you know, you salt, you add salt and pepper, you dry it, in a, you, you brown it in a dry pan, and then you put it in a hot oven, like 400 degrees for six minutes, exactly. Then you take it out, you put a lump of butter in with the meat, and then some herbs or crushed um, uh, garlic, and then you baste, 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 baste. No heat, you're just basting until the crust of the meat absorbs all that fat and um, uh, all that butter. And then you let the meat rest. And while the meat is resting, you make the chanterelle cream sauce. It's got marsala in it. Fabulous, so good. Um, this was another uh, dish that's kind of had cream, eggs, butter, and cheese in it. Um, and that, this is this lovely baked eggs with bullets and peas. So we saw a lot of recipes of that sauce, of that type. And then there, I saw a lot of um, recipes um, pair, you know, that had pairings, that had ingredients that meat likes. Um, onion, garlic, shallot, leeks, and thyme, you know, rosemary, paprika, hot peppers, vinegar. You know, just think meat spices. Um and it, it was a lesson, you know, a kind of realization that what meat likes, mushrooms like too. I mean, and it's one of the reasons why it's quite easy to replace the meat in your recipes with mushrooms, you know, keeping morphology in mind. Um, and, uh, um, and you'll find that they will often behave um, just the way you want them to behave. Um, the maitake pate here, by the way, comes from the incredible Julie Schreiber of the Sonoma Club. Um, so, yeah, I can take a question or two. Should we do that or should I carry on? <laughs> carry on? Carry on. Okay, I'm going to keep going. All right, so there was a certain amount of repeat recipes like cream soups, you know, onions, mushrooms, a roux, stock, cream. Um, and I could tell by reading some of the recipes that, um, you know, that that some of them would require more development in terms of writing the recipe than I could handle time-wise. Um, you know, like the recipe would just come in too elemental. And, you know, I, you know, I could tell, wow, maybe it, maybe it would be really delicious. Um, but I couldn't tell because the recipe couldn't accurately show me how to get there. And, um, you know, and there just wasn't the time for me to, to develop with the author. And then what if it turned out, you know, I spent a whole lot of time with them. And then if I could put the the recipe in the collection and that would just be kind of a waste of their time i i didn't want to i didn't want to do that um but that was a bummer um there was a bunch of recipes we couldn't do as a result um some were just problematic like black trumpets and wine you know i was like is it safe huh, sure you know uh so i asked Britt bunyard and he was like no problem if you don't mind getting a little food poisoning. He said, it's got to be like hard alcohol, you know, like vodka, ethyl alcohol in order to be safe. Otherwise, there are microorganisms that can cause stomach upset that can survive the acidity of, um, of, a, uh, of a wine. So I had to pass on that. Um, otherwise, I guess you could cook the black trumpet and, you know, put it in there. Just kind of weird, but you could, I suppose. Um, you know, so that in is, in essence, sterilizing the mushroom before popping it in the wine. We also got some canned um, foods like pickles, but since I couldn't be sure of their shelf stability, and I actually am very careful about. Um, you know, I've written numerous canning recipes and um, and uh, one book exclusively on canning. 
and um uh, and I have a master's in canning. I'm a master canner, which is really not a big deal. It's sort of like getting your driver's license. But anyway, you know, I wanted to be super careful. Um, I like to use USDA data, uh, USDA data for um, canning. Um, and um, uh, so I was like, eh. we. so I turned all the recipes that were canned into refrigerator pickles um, um, because I could be more confident in their, about their safety. Um, there were some college tries, but complete flops. So I'm only going to share one of mine, this recipe. Um, beans, maitake, and mussels. I don't know, it's just kind of gross. Just I like the idea, but it eh, didn't work. Um, but actually, a recipe came along later from Graham Steinruck um, that called for mussels and mushrooms. And it's fabulous. So, you know, I was gratified that that combination that there was a chef out there who could pull off that combination um and some were just wacky like this recipe oh my god so this is oyster mushrooms and sweet potatoes and like roasted red peppers and that was the dish i mean it's not even really a dish but i really wanted to publish it because the author's recipe writing was so so great um she was from split croatia and she said things like in her head note, it said, you should get even more relaxed of this symphony and indulge yourself in some excellent Cabernet Sauvignon, which I think she had been drinking while she was writing, a perfect wine pairing for this main course. I had it after surviving severe COVID complications and it boosted my mood and relaxed me. You know, so I was like in love with her already. But then I read the recipe note and usually recipe notes have things like, you know, substitutions and stuff in it. But, but hers was, her, her, her note, right, at the end of the recipe was, be joyful, relaxed, and slow as you can while you cook. Enjoy the flow. Hence, slow cooking. It's a mindful process, not a quick sex drive. Pardon my French. Observe it. Taste your pairing red, your pairing red wine and go back to have your moment with these royal oysters. <laughs> so I would have loved to have published that, but um, but at the end of the day, a cookbook is really only as good as the, as the recipes deliver. Um, so we did that. Some of the recipes really uh, stretched my knowledge. <clears throat> I'm a Mediterranean cook, primarily an Italian cook. Um, uh, but Asian cookery is rich with excellent mushroom recipes. And these are some that we got. This is chicken, uh, uh, chicken wings with woodier mushrooms and a variety of Chinese spices. Again, it's like a five ingredient dish. So easy and so delicious. You can use fresh woodier or you can use dried. We tested with both. This is a mushroom tempura. Delicious. Um, this is a wild dish. It's shiitake and cauliflower with a numbing chili sauce. It's of Szechuan origin, I think. But it's the first time that I actually made at home a dish that created that, you know, that tingly, nummy thing that can happen in your lips with Szechuan cooking. Um, this, re this recipe does that. Um, it's cool. It's like an added experience beyond appetite. Um, uh, this is a, um, a Matsutake Dobinmushi, um, which Langdon Cook shared with us. So Langdon is a wonderful author. He wrote The Mushroom Hunters um, quite a few years ago. Uh, anyway, this is a steamed mushroom fish, a mushroom and uh, Matsutake and fish soup. Very, very lovely. And um, Matsutake Gohan rice from uh, your fellow Bay Area uh, my college is Dr. Fun Guy, um, who's got a big presence on Instagram and is working on um, his first book. Um, when he first sent in this recipe, because it called for a lot of matsutake, not a cheap mushroom, uh, I um, I tested it with um, uh, with uh, king trumpets, mm -hmm. and it worked great. So just in case you ever or in that sort of spot, you can give the king trumpets a um, a try and see if they substitute well. All right, so by the spring, so we're going over the course of the winter with these recipes, and, and by the spring, 
Um, the recipes were really coming from all over the country. Lots in California, of course, and on the East Coast. You know, all these dots represent places where we had recipes. And this is not even, you know, all. Um, but wow, you know, from all kinds of places. Um, and it was sort of exciting to actually map this community, how big it really was. Um, and then around that time in the spring is when the sort of tipping point happened. And suddenly I realized, I, I just realized we had enough recipes. And um, I told that to the folks who um, at, 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 at um, Fantastic Fungi and they had a publisher lined up and I said, okay, we can do it. And so the book deal came through. So the deal called for a hundred recipes and 90 photographs. I tested about 250 recipes to get there, most of them multiple times. So this was my operating criteria for the collection. One, did the cake rise? You know, I'm kind of telling you like the, my version of this, you know, did the cake rise? Two, did it taste good? And three, you know, would the author agree to whatever changes I had to make and um, uh, and to just be participating in the book? And also, you know, were they relatively original recipes? Um, in some cases, authors just didn't follow the guidelines at all. For example, they included links in lieu of instructions, that, like so we couldn't do it or there was just too little information in the recipe. Um, and I would have to assume too much. And so the collection really was, you know, hemmed in on all these different sides. And here, this is just, these, these are my files of recipes, typing them up, testing them, making notes, retyping them on and on and on. I mean, it was, I love doing it, so it was fun, but it was a big job for one. <laughs> Um, so as I tested, you know, madly, like two to three recipes a day, uh, sometimes multiple times, and I should point out that we ate mushrooms basically for eight months straight. Um, and I don't, you know, we didn't, we weren't the worst for it by any means. Um, if I had done a baking book, like a dessert book, I might've gained some weight, but not doing this one. Um, Anyway, all throughout this testing process, what I would do is I take photos with my phone of the dishes to see what would look best. And this is like, I highly recommend this if you're going to do a cookbook um, and you're testing your recipes. So I take a picture at, at, with a Maison Plus, then I take a picture kind of in preparation, and then I take a picture finished. Um, and that kind of gives me an idea of what I might want to do, you know, how I might want to illustrate this dish down the road, because it could taste incredible. But if it looks kind of crappy, you know, that's not going to sell the recipe to the reader. So in this case, for example, I might have chosen instead to do the, um, you know, in preparation version of this dish. But I, we didn't actually publish this one, but um, you know, it's a good example of what I would do. And then sometimes, you know, I just forget to photo it until I like already eaten some. <laughs> and that was the case of this Hootlacoche crepes, which are delicious, by the way. Um, and uh, yeah, so I didn't end up doing, we did publish this recipe, but didn't end up doing a picture uh, of it because, you know, I also it just, it's very hard to make something like this look yummy um, and, and still be illustrative, you know, to still show you um, or illustrative, I guess is what I mean to say, um, you know, so you could see the mushrooms. So the administration was really complicated. Um, usually for a cookbook, I get 12 months. I figure out what the recipes are in the collection as a whole. And I show that list of recipes or, you know, the recipes themselves to the editor. And then the editor like always okays it. And she goes, and maybe she'll say, okay, you know, can you put a couple of pizzas in there or something, or, you know, we need more baked goods or something. So then, you know, there's a few more fixes. The collection is complete. And then you go to photography, pick which ones you're going to photograph. Um, but that's not how this book was going to happen. The company, the publishers, a company called Inside Editions, they wanted this book fast. And so they what they said is 
that we they what they asked for was a rolling editorial plan that would speed up the release date. So a rolling editorial plan is like they wanted to see they wanted me to as a recipe was completed or a photograph was completed, they wanted to see it and start trying to build the book from their end. It was uh, it's a hard way to do it because you can't really see the overall arc and make so many changes. Um, but we did the best we could within those limitations. Um, so, so what I needed to do is I would test the recipes and if they were delicious, then I would send the, um, uh, I would ask for, uh, uh, for, um, uh, permission to publish it. And almost everybody said, yes, a couple of people were like, you know, no, um, but 99.9% of people said yes. Then I'd format the recipe. Then I would contact, then I would send that formatted recipe to the author because I would have to make some changes. Um, for example, authors, most people, when they cook, they use whole food measures like, um, you know, the juice of half a, a lemon. You can't really do that in a you know professional context. You have to say, well, it's actually two tablespoons of lemon juice or a half a lemon. You know, you have to you um or you do weights and measures, um, but you really have to give them um a, a specific you know uh, you have to give a measurement that's very specific. So I would have to make those adjustments. I'd use my own palate to a degree, and then I would run the recipe by the authors to say, okay, are we in alignment? So this was actually, um, it would, took a lot of time. I mean, I probably would speak for an hour with each author about their recipe and getting to know them because I was also writing head notes about them and how they got into mushrooms and stuff. Um, and even though it was like incredibly time consuming, so I spent, you know, at least a hundred hours um, talking to authors about their recipes. Um, it, it was by far the most rewarding aspect of it. I mean, it was really just so great to get to know people. I mean, my job was to get to know them and their recipe. And so, you know, it was, it was like a perfect job. It was ideal. Um, and I really enjoyed that process. Then I get the okay. Then it would go to the editor and then it'd be edited and then it would be, um, you know, proofed and stuff. And then there was the question of photography. So the rolling photography had to happen as well. Um, by the way, <laughs> that's also when I find out, when I talk to the authors, I find out something like, oh no, that was supposed to be boneless chicken thighs. And I would have already tested it with bones in and maybe already photographed it, um, because I had to keep churning out these photographs. Um, and in some cases I would reach out and say, where, how do you feel about this? You know, and. Um, only one person was like, nah, I don't like the way that looks and that's not going to be okay. But otherwise it was all good. Um, so the editor, Vanessa, and I kind of sorted through the challenges of a rolling publications. And one is creating chapters. Since we didn't know what would come in, you know, over, you know, in, in a month, you know, that might be an excellent recipe, um, we didn't know, you know, what the diversity of foods was going to look like. Um, like, so how do you anticipate for that? You know, um, uh, how do we, how do you organize something that you don't know what it is in totality? Um, so, you know, we thought, okay, could we do small plates and large plates? Well, you know, that doesn't make sense because small plate can be a main if it's enough food. And, um, then we thought, well, first course, second course, but that's kind of Eurocentric and didn't really represent the diversity of our uh, writers and um, uh, and just didn't seem like a good uh, good way to go. So finally, we resolved uh, we resolved it after checking in with the master, uh, Jane Grigson, who, if you don't know this book, I highly recommend, you know, I, I recommend you do a search for it and see if you can find it. It's a terrific book. Um, and so with help from what Jane did, um, we came up with this table of contents. Now, I knew from experience that people eat with their eyes. So I really wanted excellent photography. Um, 
And uh, and so I reached out to Evan Sung. Um, you can go on his website and see what I'm talking about. He's he's pretty amazing. And he knows cookbooks. I mean, he's done, he has shot dozens of cookbooks. I actually knew him from working on pro- a project with him and for the New York Times. And um, and I was and I knew he was really, really easy to work with and just couldn't be a nicer person. Um and uh, you know, it was COVID going on at those in in those days, and um, there wasn't a whole lot of work, and uh, you know, we didn't have the kind of budget that a lot of Evans clients have. But considering, it, but the timing was, or the social circumstances were such that he was amenable um, to working on this book. Um, but beyond that, he had just been down to Chile where he met, you know, who our friend Juliana Furci. And so he was all hot and bothered about mushrooms and really happy to participate. Um, so the photography was really insane. We had three, three day blitzes of 10 recipes a day. Um, the, uh, the first uh, day this uh, the first three day block was in January, and day two was January sixth. So we actually took pictures of food while like the Capitol was being assaulted on the TV. Um, so the prep for this was insane. Um, the storage, the prop, the propping. You know, all these little, you know, so here, you know, this is like my fridge. There's just, it was so packed. It was, in, it was just crazy. And, and, and then all the props, I had to put these little cards on them to remind myself, okay, this prop goes with, you know, this pan goes with this dish. Um, and this dish takes parsley or potatoes on the side, you know, the cooking, the cleanup, this is my dishwasher, <laughs> Right? It's one of those little numbers that you plug into your sink. And you know, it doesn't hold very many dishes. And plus, it sounds like you next door to JFK or something, you know, jets taking off. It was so loud. Um, but um, we actually took a lot of pictures of food. We got our, um, I mean, we managed to stay on top of our 10 recipes a day in that first section. Um the problem with the shooting in January is that there aren't a lot of fresh mushrooms around. But we were saved by Far West Fungi of San Francisco, who um, sent us these glorious boxes of mushrooms, um, which we took pictures of and we cooked with. Um, and so I would, the book credits Far West Fungi for the mushrooms in the book. Um, this uh the the amount of work was insane i couldn't do all the cooking myself um so two friends joined me to help one is pam kraus who's the editor of my Cophilia and is currently the editor of have a good trip and um and this is uh neni panergia who is a fantastic home cook and between the two of them they um, I probably have like a hundred years of cooking experience and they're great. They're all covered with burns, you know, and they worked like 10 hours a day for three days and all they wanted for it was like a bourbon at the end of the day. Um, I, I have a lot of props. I've always done my own, um, food styling, but, um, in this case, I really wanted, I, you know, it was a different kind of challenge. This is not my own food. And I, and I really wanted everyone's dishes to feel a little different from each other, but there also had to be um, like a consistency from photo to photo and a certain elegance. So I was lucky that I could borrow a whole bunch of stuff from um, my friend, Natalie uh, Smith, who used to have this store global table in New York. So a lot of the dishes came out of this store. She's since sold the store. Um, so food photography is really challenging. It's it's kind of porn, you know? Um, like risotto, for example, is really hard to make look good in, in photographs. You know, creamy things in general, like this is Jack Zernacki's poached eggs with ham and chanterelle cream sauce. And it's, you know, I mean, it's really hard to make sure it doesn't look like 
going to vomit. <laughs> you know, it's just tough. Um, and sometimes, and some things were just really hard for me to cook. You know, it took me like three tries to make this fucking t- potato mushroom tortilla. It's delicious. It's delicious without a doubt, but oh my God, it really ate up an afternoon. Um, and the challenge, <laughs> there's also the challenge of shooting dishes where you can't actually see the mushroom. So in this case, this is creamed eggs with button mushrooms. You know, you can't see them. Here you've got a smoky black bean and hoot lacoche soup. Can't see the hoot lacoche. And in this case, um, this is Brussels sprouts with uh, truffle oil, one with um, uh, white truffle oil and the other with black truffle oil. This is Oregon ch- truffle oil. This is another Jack Zernecki, um recipe. Um, yeah, I guess I could have dribbled some truffle oil on the marble, but uh, it's a hard thing to pull off, you know. But in, there are a few of those pictures in there. Um, during the ch- kitchen shoots, uh, during the... <laughs> During those shoots, the kitchen situation was grueling. You know, as the day would progress, I'd start losing stuff like the pepper mill or I'd misplace the pop prop cards. And I was like, who gets, who gets the tarragon? Um, But over time, I kind of figured out by like the second, mm, even pushing the third shoot, I like, I said, ah, you know, I gotta, I've got to really figure out I have to have a really good idea of which shot comes next and how to manage the oven use. So then I would look up all the times and I could say, okay, you know, if I do this, I can put in the creamed eggs and I can put in the brie, but the brie, by the way, is delicious. I'm going to show you a picture of it in a minute. Um, And, um, you know, they can go in at the same time and I take one out two minutes earlier. Um, oh no, they're different temperatures. So we have something like this. I could put in the um, the cheesy mushrooms. I don't even remember what that is at the same time as the creamed egg and I just take it out five minutes later. Anyway, it, you know, it's discombobulating to even tell the story. So I can't even tell you how crazy it was in the kitchen. Um, but, you know, we got it done. Um, and Evan kept printing out these nifty little Polaroids, which I kind of, I thought were souvenirs. You know, he had a little tiny printer. It was so cool. Um, you know, I figured he was giving them to me to show my friends, my family. But then on the second to the last day of shooting, a member of the New York Mycology, New York Mycological Society, who's a professional food stylist dropped in. She said, let me help you with a few dishes. And, and she goes, where are hold on she goes where's the storyboard and i was like oh so i had done a a cookbook it had been a while since i had done a cookbook so the the like printing out the little polaroids was new technology for me um because that's what this is that's the point of these little um of these little polaroids is that um, so it's so that you can see the props and the angles and and thereby create variety in the chapter. Um, so I'm going to show you on that. So right away, I went and pinned them all up and I was like, oh, let's go see. Have I used that red napkin a million times? OK, here's a quick look at the Fantastic Fungi Community Cookbook. Uh, mushrooms with pasta, rice and soup mushrooms on their own or with vegetables. There's lots of those. Mushrooms with eggs, mushrooms with fish, mushrooms with poultry, mushrooms with meat, and mushroom desserts, drinks, and condiments. (laughs) Okay. Okay. Oh, all right. So with the photography, we started out with pretty standard stuff, which would be process shots, setups like this. Um, you know, you need kind of that sort of variation in uh, in a cookbook to keep the, um, I think, to keep the reader sort of engaged. Um, it feels, you sort of break up the static of these sort of setup shops, shots. Anyway, this is a uh, chicken um, that's w- cooked with um, 
a bottle of sherry, a stick of butter, and as many morels as you can spare. That's a wonderful dish that's of um that's of uh, French origin um, and it's credited to Britt Bunyard. Uh, this is a um, uh, ravioli, homemade raviolis with stuff with a little chanterelle and ricotta stuffing. Um, this is a crab and cordyceps soup. And so, you know, we put some little cracker props in it, stuff like that. We also had to do all kinds of little shots. And this is something that I don't know, if you do a cookbook, you got to keep in mind. They're, they're really useful to the art director. And if you don't provide them, then they buy them from, you know, a, a, a photo supply. So, you know, when there was ever spare, little spare spices and things like that, we would take a picture of it and have it available to the art director. And she used them. Um, and then by the second shoot, I started to think a little differently about how to look at something. Um, so for example, this is a, um, agaricus by Spora, so white button, mushroom, fennel, and blood orange salad, which we just spread on a piece of marble. Um, no plate at all. And this is very graphic, but this is a beautiful little recipe. This is the brie recipe. It's from Larry Evans from the Montana Club. Maybe you've met him or spoken to your club before, but it's a really great recipe. He takes a, a, a wheel of brie, cuts it at the equator, and he sautés morels, he adds nutmeg, which is a really nice sort of ingredient in the, this case. Puts the morels on top of the brie. Then he, you know, puts the top back on the brie and wraps the whole thing in puff pastry. You know, like Pepperidge Farm frozen puff pastry is fine. And then you bake it in the oven. It happens very quickly when it comes out. It's just the most luscious, wonderful dish. Um, and this is a uh, candied um, woodier. Delicious, kind of crunchy and really just cool. Um, and I even tried some risky stuff. <laughs> so uh, here, this is a, a dish of um, pork tenderloin with chanterelles and apricot jam, but I put it on a background of soil, which is it's sort of what's one of my favorite pictures. Um, and in this, this is the, the candy cap punch uh milk punch that i mentioned earlier and i put some like xanax in the plate but the publisher said no you can't do that but i thought it was pretty fun <laughs> and then here this one is um uh, from a woman dorothy carpenter she's in uh st louis and and she's a like a society gal and she made this wonderful um toast with uh cream pleurettes she said calls them pleurettes you know oyster mushrooms and, you know, I was showing my daughter those Polaroids before I realized that they were actually for a storyboard. And my daughter said, you know, these are beautiful, but nobody, nobody's food looks like that. Most of the time you're eating in front of the TV. And I was like, yes, that's an idea. We'll do a photo like that. So we did the setup with our compute with a computer and, you know, made, made Dorothy a little martini and her pleurettes on toast. And then on the the computer in the background, we put a movie and the movie we put on, it's the French connection, which I just thought was kind of cool. Um, and then this I'd say is my favorite kind of secret photograph in that there's something in it that only the people I tell about know. And that is this recipe is for the a wild mushroom uh, quiche from um, Gary Linkoff and um, his uh, widow, um, Irene Lieberman, and um, it's a delicious quiche, an absolutely delicious quiche. Um, I borrowed these field notebooks of La of Gary's from Irene, um, and we put them in the shoot. If you open these field notes books, notebooks, they are full of you know Gary details, like just notes about favorite trees in Central Park and what mushrooms were up where and what the weather was and to quote from Henry David Thoreau. It, it actually kind of chokes me up to, every time I look at this picture. So after edit, you know, that it's edited and then copy edited comes layout and then proofing. I mean, that's why these books take so damn long. Um, the very last thing to be established uh, was the title and the cover. So titling and covers always like a push pull between editorial and marketing. You know, we, we need each other. I mean, edit, 
editorial tries to protect the content's integrity, but marketing is trying to get the content out there. So the the folks at Inside Edition, they they tended to want to they they wanted to call originally wanted to call the book Fantastic Fungi, the Community Cookbook with a brand signed, and I objected. I was like, that's like saying Obi Wan Kenobi's Great Book of Chicken Recipes. I just I persuaded them that we we had an upmarket book and I and I wanted to respect the authors, you know, and stay away from like a fan book. Um, you know, we were all into mushrooms. That's what it's really about. Um, so we ended up settling on this title, which is a kind of hedge. Um, and uh, and this photo of Graham Steinrich's um, shiitake duck congee, really delicious. Um, I also convinced our publicist, you know, because the Inside Edition has a publicist that handles all the books. And and I convinced him to let all of our authors speak for themselves in their local markets. So if we got a call from, say, uh, a newspaper in Seattle, we could say, oh, well, you know, if you want to talk to somebody about the book, talk to Langdon Cook. He's local. He's one of the authors. He's representing the book. And I really thought, you know, the more voices out there, I don't care how loose or um, amateurish or whatever people were. That's great. That's who we are. And I was all for it. And to a degree, we were able to do that. Or, you know, that offer was taken up. Um, I also insisted and got um, authors discounts for all for all 50 plus authors. Um which is important, you know, we, it allows them to buy the books at a discount and they can give them as Christmas gifts or whatever. Um, and they can do that in perpetuity. Um, and all, and finally we did have a book party. Um, we, at this point, everybody was very like used to doing zoom like we are now. And, um, we had a party for, um, uh, for not 50 of, of our authors showed up, but, you know, I can't remember something like 40 of them showed up. And I think it's probably the biggest authors publishing party in history. I mean, it's a lot of authors who, who um, rang in over five time zones, all of who um, had, you know, glasses of wine and we had breakout groups where people got to know each other. A bunch of people promised to meet and tell your mushroom festival the following fall, which they did. Um, it was, you know, I was just over the moon excited. I got kind of sloshed, but it was great, really great fun. Um, and a wonderful experience. So, um, a few takeaways from cooking all these different recipes by so many authors. Number one, I learned, um, how many different tastes there are out there and how those tastes of mushrooms, you know, and how those tastes can be enhanced by combining them with complementary ingredients. So chanterelles and apricots, hericium and fish. I saw that kind of intuition happening over and over again in the book. Um, number two, mushrooms ability to withstand almost any kind of cooking. That was a real revelation that came out of this book and um, the enoki um, soup that I mentioned, that story is a case in point. Um, number three, Mushrooms easily substitute for meat in recipes. Um, and really how you cook meat can inform how you can cook mushrooms. Um, and four, I really learned to love the cultivated varieties on a whole new level. Um, years ago, many years ago, when I first started getting into wild mushrooms, um, I had a and I, I had a little conversation with Jacques Pepin. He's a friend of my dad's. And um, Jacques, uh, and I was like kind of bragging a little bit about, I was showing off, I guess, about wild mushrooms and kind of putting down, the, you know, supermarket varieties and white button mushrooms and being like about them. And and Jacques, you know, Jacques is a very wise guy and a very subtle guy. And he, he told me, oh no, you know, the champignon is a delicious mushroom. And, and he said, in any way, it's not the mushroom, it's the cook. Um, so finally, most of all, I think um, while I knew there were many terrific cooks in our mushroom community, I think um, getting to know some of them is really what's truly um, been the most enriching part of all.
So that's my talk. I'm going to stop my share and um, I'm going to end my show. Hold on a sec. Hi. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Eugenia. That, that was an incredible presentation. Uh, I didn't know what to expect and to see the, uh, you know, the behind the scenes uh, information about putting that book together was uh, really fascinating. So thank you very much. I'm so glad. Uh, thank you. Will you remind us of your email for any unanswered questions? Yeah, if anybody, um, yeah, if anyone wants to correspond or has questions, usually, you know, folks say, um, oh, why, how, do, how can I make them less slimy and stuff like that? I'm happy to correspond. You know, I talk to people all day about mushrooms. It's my joy and um, look forward to hearing from you all and uh, further enriching my life by getting to know you better. Thank you. It was a great talk. Thanks so much. Thank you.